Bon appetit, and welcome to a gastrophonic episode of Genre Grinder. This month, we're talking about food-themed movies, and my guest is the person I share the most of my meals with, my significant other, Christine Fisher. Say hello, Christine. Hello, Christine. And why are you here, Christine? Um, I chose to focus on feast-themed movies, um, mainly because I have a latent culinary degree, and when I say latent, there's a time frame that it can be used. Typically, within a year of getting it, you need to use it, or basically you lose all all the knowledge. I mean, you you know that from having a a graphic design degree. Like, there's a certain amount of time where that knowledge becomes irrelevant. You can't use it no more. Same thing. Anyway, I still have happy memories of it. A lot of the knowledge still remains in my brain from my schooling days back then. Also, we're part of a um, Facebook group called Social Deliciousing. Do we want to out Tyler for being mm. the lead of that group? Uh, Tyler is probably the only one listening to this that would even, yeah, it would even matter. <gasps> I don't know how many. Yeah, it's just some of our friends. Yeah, and they post horribly wonderful pictures of their finished, completed dishes, and they're just so great. And it's all the food that you make during quarantine. And it's just, people are just such artists sometimes when it comes to food. So that's why I'm like, social licensing, we should watch some like feast based movies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, technically, Minnesota is open, and we actually just went to a restaurant today. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're still getting a lot of meals delivered and takeouts. Yeah, using up a lot of DoorDash. And I still try to cook at the same level I did um, back during quarantine. But it's just, why do it if you can, like, get delivery or or, um, go to a restaurant? There was a brief period where I was cooking with you in the other room because you were working from home That's and right. I could run into the other room and ask you directions yes. and as soon as you weren't in the other room anymore I didn't enjoy cooking anymore oh. <laughs> I actually <laughs> uh, kind of hate cooking I you know that listeners don't I'm not a fan I don't enjoy it uh, I like eating and I like lots of kinds of food mm-hmm. I, I tell people I am uh, I can appreciate uh, very special food mm-hmm. and I also uh, am not picky so this is true yeah, I'll I'll eat whatever and and uh yeah, there's not I I don't like mushrooms, but I actually can even eat mushrooms. It's olives are really the thing I hate. Correct. Yeah. There's no hiding olives. I can't think of any case where I like olives. So so the idea here is uh food themed movies and that's not really a genre. Mm-hmm. Um it's a type of movie usually within a genre, like so it would be like something else would be related to. And I think most people the first thing that would pop into their head would be one of the many food documentaries yes um i have many favorite food documentaries right and those really picked up i would say in the mid to late 2000s Mm -hmm. with netflix and hulu and amazon streaming i think because they're not expensive to make and they Mm -hmm. almost guarantee streaming views yeah and chefs needed something to do yeah and then um, there's like there was a big um, uptick in documentaries during the '70s from Les Blank. Yeah, Les and Blank, who uh, I, is most famous for directing the uh, uh, Burden of Dreams about the yes. making of uh, of uh, Fitzcarraldo. Yeah. Um, but yes, he was uh, he was he did a lot of shorter, you know, thirty minutes to an hour long documentaries. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are on uh, Criterion, actually. Yes. Um, My favorite was Garlic as Good as Ten Mothers. Yeah, so he would go to, like, festivals. Yes. And he would, I, I assume he was an outsider. I never researched this, but mm-hmm. I assume he was more of an outsider. So he was interested in the way the food was made. Yes, and the kind of obsession that people had for things. Whereas I think that uh, I kind of stopped watching all the documentaries, that we, the newer ones, because they kind of fall into a formula. And in most cases, they're really about either the chef as a celebrity yes. or the business of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the really good ones like Geo Jeans of Sushi yes. um, is a pretty good, uh, for me, way of describing how to make sushi and what mm-hmm. goes into sushi. Mm-hmm. But it's such a great movie in part because it's relaxing and also because it's an interesting kind of tragic story yes. about the way this this older guy is not really letting his son mm-hmm. move out and the kind of way that sushi is super expensive. and yes. Yeah. Some people refer to it as being food porn, which I totally agree with. Yeah. They're, like, laminating, like, fresh pieces of fish with, like, their, their house-branded, like, soy sauce or, like, mirin on top. And that's just just beautiful settings, like, 
like Beethoven sort of um, music swelling, like class, like oh, here it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's of course there's the Food Network and all the shows mm-hmm. that I believe was it like A and E or Bravo that before there was a separate Food Network had cooking shows, mm-hmm. and there's of course um, the classic PBS ones. Yes. Uh, I would say for our childhood, the first celebrity chef I remember just sort of standing out was Wolfgang Puck. Mine was uh, Galloping Gourmet, Yan Kan Cook, Yan and Kan Cook. Julia Child. Yeah, Julia Child's like the the original, mm-hmm. but she already when we when I was you know born in nineteen eighty, she mm-hmm. was already an older idea. Mm-hmm. I remember Wolfgang Puck being like the new the new hotness the when I was like, of it all. yeah, and then that became like celebrity chefs are now a big thing. Oh yeah, to the point where there's a movie in theaters right now about Bourdain, Anthony Bourdain. Yes, uh, who had what five. 20 different TV shows over his career. Well, I would <laughs> and say... And produced Joe Beam of Sushi. That's right, he did. <laughs> I would say in total he had three-ish... Was it three? Shows. Yeah. And then it's it's up for debate about if, if No Reservations was a cooking show versus him just traveling to was, go to different restaurants. Yeah, it was like a restaurant show. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, we're not really talking about those. No. So we're just kind of getting that Leave out of the way. Out of your mind. That's that's like a separate thing that I don't think I'll ever plan on covering. But you know, much respect to the idea of food documentaries and how they became super mega popular within the last decade or so. Um, the and other we're, things that there that you want to put on your mind as a listener is that we're not going to be talking about scenes of movies involving food. Right. So, um, like, there's a lot of movies that have famous food scenes. Uh, the one I always think of is the uh, making spaghetti in prison scene in Goodfellas. Mm-hmm. With the razor blade. Razor blade cuts it so thin that it melts in the pan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's like one of the best. I mean, all almost all of Scorsese's, well, not all, but a lot of Scorsese's earlier things are about food. Mm-hmm. Food comes up a lot. Um, and his mom did the catering for his films? Yeah. That's and awesome. Coppola is the same way. In the Godfather movies, we'll have a lot of food scenes. Yeah. Um, and oranges is being symbolic. Yeah, yeah, food is symbolic of death. Um, mm-hmm. And when I was telling my mother we were doing this, she she couldn't remember the name of it, but she's like that one cartoon. She's only uh, she's a Japanese cartoon, and I thought and she'd only seen one Japanese cartoon that I can think of, which yeah. was uh, Spirited Away. Lovely. And so I was like, yes, pretty much all of mm-hmm. Hayao Miyazaki's movies have beautiful food moments mm-hmm. that actually make you more hungry than live action food sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, and Ratatouille is another example, and not Japanese animated, but animated movie. Mm-hmm. That's a very high-grossing Pixar film. So. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite uh, food moments in a, in a movie is during Hook, when he's with the Lost Boys, and he's trying to understand like their, their ideas about um, envisioning food, food that isn't there, and he's kind of breaking past his like self-imposed sort of adulthood. Like, this mm-hmm. is nonsense. These kids are so immature. They need to go to school. They need discipline. And eventually he just lets himself think and imagine, and then he sees the same food that they do. I think that's a great moment. You hate that movie, though. Not a fan of that movie, but I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, only scenes I really ever remember with any fondness are ones with uh, the Lost Boys. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, yeah, Rufio in particular. Everybody it's... wanted to be Rufio. So uh, we're not really talking about those, not really talking about the animated movies, of which there are plenty. There's also a, a series that we'll probably get into later, there's an anime series yes. called Food Wars. We're going to get get to that later. Um, so basically we picked out uh, it was five or six movies. Yes. And they were, uh, a lot of them were just listed as, like, if you punch in the best food movies into Google, these come up. And uh, the thing I figured out that they sort of have in common, and we're, we're going to, we're, it's more or less, some much more, some much less, and we'll actually actually argue about this later. Mm-hmm. But in general, these kind of fit the idea of magical realism. Yeah. Uh, magical realism is one of those stylistic terms like science fiction mm-hmm. uh, that critics will happily argue to define, but who knows what it really, really means. Like, there are there are prime examples, and then there are all these examples on the edges of the frame, like, well, does this count? Yes. Um, for our purposes, I'm thinking of it as it's Your a purpose my is, purposes. This is you. It's a real world setting with some kind of supernatural element that fits the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of light fantasy is another way to think about it. It's usually not multiple crazy things going on, but like one crazy thing. Yes. Um, and I think an example I thought up is uh, spaghetti westerns 
are these highly textured worlds that that uh they look like ours and they even have the same histories as ours mm -hmm. but there are people who have these supernatural gun shooting powers yes. and well the people in the movie are impressed by that mm -hmm. it's not like oh my god we just saw a superhero it's not like in superman when someone sees superman flying yes. everybody freaks the fuck out because that's more of a science fiction or fantasy movie. in the spaghetti western people are gonna be like huh how about that oh shit i can't fight this guy he's too good of a shot <laughs> instead of holy crap he shot 12 bullets out of a gun to hold six Whoa. and hit my hat every single time um yeah it's not like they saw a ufo um and so uh, and then the other interesting thing that happened is we ended up with this collection of movies, and I realized they fit almost a perfect decade. It's technically 11 years, mm -hmm. and uh, they're all different countries. Yep. We oh, have two yes, movies yes, that we yes. disagree with the idea of magical fantasy. Correct. Of, and they're not the first one we're going to cover here, uh, which is uh, Juzo Itami's uh, Tampopo from 1985. And we're doing this in chronological order like yes. I usually do, and I'm... I mean, there are food-themed movies before 1985, some that might even be mystical realism, mm -hmm. uh, plenty that you're thinking of off the top of your head right now. For whatever reason, a lot of this sort of golden decade for food movies starts in the mid-'80s and ends in the mid-'90s, and yes. I have no idea why that happens, but it's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and Tampopo is a pretty famous movie. It describes itself uh, on its advertising as a ramen western to make fun of the term spaghetti western. But there are so many other genres. Right. But it's really, um, uh, Jacques Tati is the best description, even though it's Japanese. It's mm -hmm. very uh, humorous, French New Wave era, mm -hmm. kind of uh, very playful movie. Yeah, it has vignettes that are of a certain style, right. revolving around this one story about this woman who wants to improve her ramen shop. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's sort of a, somewhere between uh, Mary Poppins... Which, if they didn't go into the chalk painting, I feel like would be magical realism because she's like the one <laughs> magical thing and that that can do stuff. But she acts like she's kind of annoyed by it. I've noticed. Yeah. Like, like God, it's chalk she's seen painting. It before. Yeah. But in this case, yeah, there are two uh, truck drivers, uh, Goro and Gun, and uh, Gun's actually Ken Ken Watanabe, very young Ken Watanabe, and they uh, happen upon this woman who wants to become a great ramen chef. Yes. And they're sort of, it's sort of a reversed version of, of Mary Poppins where she's the normal person mm -hmm. and everyone else around her is a Mary Poppins trying to impart wisdom onto her with yes. their abilities. Yep. I looked at it as being like gathering a perfect team of specialists mm -hmm. who are good at one thing. And then you found that there was a Pygmalion sort Pygmalion of... Pygmalion or a, a, a My Fair Lady, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit like that where people are trying to take this sort of downtrodden woman and, and build her up into this. And build uh, up her son, too. Or yeah. There's stuff going on. Um, but, it's, but it's sort of like the cuteness of it is that everybody's just sort of doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Yes. And that she's genuinely a sweet person that really wants to help people. Mm -hmm. But she still has agency in everything she's doing. Yes. Um, there are scenes where she'll um, trick She'll be trying to figure out how to how to do the noodles correctly, so she'll trick a guy at a rival noodle shop into explaining how he did his noodles. Mm -hmm. Or she has one friend who will go through the trash to figure out what they got. And, yes. And so, and it's also kind of has that thing that happens in a, a, like, I notice in Japanese action anime mm -hmm. where enemies will become friends yes in, easily in, in t there's there's like the trucker and then there's another man who hate each other mm -hmm. and become they're like rivals yeah he's like, like a do low you like her yeah do you really like her why are you why are you involved with her i like her but um they end up connecting to help her yes um he does hit her interiors yeah yeah of so, her restaurant not her not body. not her interior no <laughs> no in fact the uh well, and so, yeah, while well, this is happening, so that movie is probably, this is a, a just under you two hour movie. You thought of interiors movie. and then you thought of, like, the, the uh, gangster part? Well, yeah, that, well, that's what I was thinking is that, um, I was going to say there's not a lot of sex in this movie, and there's technically not. Technically. There's but innuendo. one there's... of the ongoing, because it, it's basically like a one hour movie with almost another hour of subplots that never really connect mm -hmm. and vignettes. Yeah. And one of the subplots is a 
is a guy and his um I can't remember are they are they like cheating? Mm. Gangster and his love I, I just know it's a Yakuza and his lover and I don't know if it's like a forbidden romance. I, I don't think so. I I they have like dates. They okay. meet in the hotel room, not necessarily like like a oh we have to hide away our love. They're his um his heavies know about it too. Right. They he they want to service him and her as a as a couple. I thought it was it was totally legit. Okay. She was like a gangster mall to me. Um and so everything in this movie the main storyline, you know, is about food and how to make the food. Mm-hmm. And then this storyline is 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 basically a yakuza movie, a sixties, seventies yakuza movie, mm-hmm. with um, it still has the violence, but like the sex scenes are all replaced with eating. Yes. And so it's all about eating, uh, as a as an act of sex, mm-hmm. and including a pretty famous and grotesque scene where they, uh, crack an egg yolk and share it between their mouths over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> Which was funny watching it the first time we saw this movie was during the height of covid yeah. and that was especially gross then. <laughs> yeah how how much do you know about her yeah <laughs> do you really want to do this um the other concept i kept seeing come up both in the main story and the vignettes was the fact that how pleasure pleasurable it is to have a food that's withheld from you like it was with the guy who was behind the um the kind of like curtain or partition at this one noodle place where the woman said she was going to the bank and she said he can't have the tempura, he can't have the duck, he can't have this, he can't have that. But that's what he orders, but then he chokes on it. But how good it was to be able to, like, sate himself with that. And the kid who can't have ice cream, he has to have his carrot on his string. And then how good it is that he was able to have ice cream. Right. Some of the other vignettes are... Uh... There's a, a woman who's on her deathbed. Yes. And the doctor's like, she's done for. And her husband is desperate, and he tells her that she needs to make dinner for her family. Mm-hmm. So she gets off the deathbed and makes them fried rice. Yes. And then keels over. Yes. And I feel like that's a sort of satire of that type of drama, those, like, melodramatic... The family type movies. Yeah, super melodramatic movies. Um, but then you have this moment where, yeah, where... Uh, she is able to cook something, and then the children are crying, and the father's shouting at them, you have to finish your meal, it's the last one she'll ever make, friend. Um, <laughs> and then my favorite part is when uh, there's a grocery store clerk, and a little old woman comes in, oh, yeah! and she starts squeezing food, <laughs> and certain food is satisfying to squeeze, and some isn't, Yes. and he's trying to stop her, but she like, is staying out of... She's so quick. She's too quick for him. And so it's <laughs> it's set up kind of like a, um, a shootout. Yeah. Like he's like hiding underneath things and behind things. And but he finally gets over and, and catches her. Gets her with a fly swatter. And hits no, her no, with no. a fly swatter. Yeah. I love that whole sequence. And then there's a, one that's a little bit like... A, what did you say? It was like a... Like a, a heist. A heist movie mm-hmm. about a guy who has a... Uh, con man who does a thing where he pretends he's a professor that yes. is needed for this business needs him for something. Yes. And to fund it. Basically. To fund it, and and they pay for his expensive meal, mm-hmm. and then while they're in the bathroom, he robs them, and he gets captured by the police. He just wants one more dumpling. One more. No, he wants mushu. One more mushu pancake. Yes. And uh, and uh, it's a, it's more than implied. It's stated that he is, this is like his mm-hmm. shtick, and he's done it both. Um, the older people, the elders of the, of this movie, the actors are just given these wonderful jobs. Yeah, yeah, and they're, they're like acting against type and acting very young, mm-hmm. despite their appearances. I love that part. And it's just it's a very sweet movie all around, mm-hmm. and it's cute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I think it it has scenes like as as a non chef, the uh, scenes that are describing how to make the perfect ramen. Yes, uh, makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's one of those movies that makes me very hungry. Even when it's doing, like, the showing us how the sausage is made. Correct. Which is the part that uh, I don't deal well with very well. You know, butchering animals. I'm not a, I'm not very yes. good with butchering animals. Correct. Uh, the one scene I can't take is when they kill a little soft-shell turtle. Mm-hmm. I, I can't deal with that one. But otherwise, uh, yeah, the already killed animals that they're butchering, that stuff, like, they can go through that whole process and it still looks super tasty, so... <laughs> Good to know. 
I don't know. The, the, is if from what you know about ramen making, is it a, a successful how-to? I think so. I think um, ramen is made in a, a lot of different ways. <clears throat> what am I trying to say? Different ways similar to this. Um, there's different kinds of broths. Um, there's ultimately more um, steaming pots of, of different types of broth than what she had, which seemed like she went between two different things and different toppings and yeah. one big batch of noodles. I, I think you need to go between ramen, soba, rice noodles, egg noodles, uh, spicy broth, uh, pork broth. Basically, there's more going on in your average ramen shop than what she was depicting. Hers was very classic, very stall-like, versus a restaurant having more more pots on the stove. Right, and so I've only, I, I, I guess the ramen shops we go to aren't exactly shops. And no. It's not the 80s. No, there's a giant dining room. Yeah, so we, we got some good ramen here in Minnesota, but mm -hmm. it's it's probably... We're only, mostly known for our pho, but the ramen's good too. Yeah, and, and it seems like pho and uh, ramen have sort of similar ideals behind them yeah um but different the broths the way they're made is very specific yeah um different kinds of noodles mm -hmm. different kinds of meats different kinds of ways of presenting the meat you can have uh organ meats in there for example mm -hmm. uh which yeah one of those things i don't like to think about and just eat <laughs> just eat and don't think about it um so yeah do you have anything else about this um, particular movie? Well, with every movie, I wanted to close out with um, what ingredients make the specific cuisine. Like mm -hmm. this being Japanese cuisine, I thought about its foundational ingredients being rice, noodles, um, soybeans, seaweed, um, creating the omami flavor, the fifth flavor through soy sauce and mushrooms, uh, different kinds of meat, different kinds of seafood, uh, the concept of sushi as fish versus uh, sushi rolls or things like that uh, different kinds of vegetables they use a lot of gourds a lot of pumpkin mm -hmm. uh, wasabi rice wine vinegars um, and rice vinegars rice alcohol and, and sake and one of my favorite parts of Japanese food uh, is the fact they have a lot of convenience food and they have a lot of snacks that are ready to eat I just love that concept about Japanese food how they're able to manufacture snacks and like foods you can eat right away like ramen so so it's it's a mix of uh a, a culinary thing that that begins on an island nation that's very damp <laughs> and that closes itself off to a lot of the world for a lot Perhaps. of its history and then leads into the fact that it's a, one of the most industrious um, yes for sure. environments yes. as so people are always on the move mm -hmm. yeah that's cool that's the reason for having convenience food and stalls for restaurants because why cook at home when you have all these restaurants around you? Mm -hmm. All right, so that is uh, our first movie. Our second movie is Babette's Feast by Gabrielle Exel. I might be mispronouncing that because it is Danish. Um, mm -hmm. And it's based on the novel by uh, As Isaac uh, Dinesen, um or Isaac. It's a, it's. A, I, you'll, you'll fix it in post. I, know I don't know anything about how to spell <laughs> pronounce Danish words, unfortunately. Hey, I looked it up after we recorded, and uh, that was a pen name for Karen Blixen, who wrote both the book and the screenplay. Uh, back to our show. Um, we don't know no Danes. This is a Oscar-nominated. Like, this is a this is a very special. I mean, Tampopo, everybody loves. But this is, like, this is prestigious. 1987, so a couple years after. Um... And then this is one that you didn't think fit our... Um, it's not magical, Gabe. She doesn't think it's magical. No. I think that it's set up so much like a... Uh, based, because it's based on a story, mm -hmm. based on a book, it has such a fairy tale quality to the narrative. And I think it's heavily implied that there are magical things going on around what's happening. You Lots can of hear this, readers, but I'm, I'm, or listeners, I'm nodding along with them. I'm not taking this in as, as, as true at all. Well, yeah, okay, so this is a, a big story that's compacted. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's... Uh, it's a long period of time. Yeah, so there's... Like the a, sisters are like three, three different actresses, I think? Yeah, 19th century Denmark. Yes. They uh, These two sisters that are... Mm -hmm. um, their father is the pastor, and everybody on this on this area is particularly religious. Yes. Um, and over the years, they have suitors... Mm -hmm. And the other stuff happens, like they kind of cram a lot of that into the first 30 minutes. Yes. 
it's implied that whoever is attracted to the sisters meets some sort of demise either with um, their hobby or their their employment or their career and they they go off and away from the village as different people right which to me is sort of magical um <laughs> one of the suitors is a baritone from paris mm-hmm. and he uh sort of bequeaths them years and years later mm-hmm. uh his housekeeper slash chef correct and she's more of a refugee than right the queen. she he entrusts he entrusts their them. care on this woman who escaped um, some sort of... It's the counter... It's the revolution is happening in Paris and she's a yes. counter-revolutionary because mm-hmm. he's a rich person. Um, yes. And her name is Babette and they can't... They can't have her like... they like, we can't afford to mm-hmm. do this. Um, but she insists and... Um, I'll be in service to you mm-hmm. and you don't have to worry about anything and... Um, once something that I put um, about the, the villagers who don't leave, they just stay there, they meet as kind of like a village brain trust, and they meet with their yeah. father, the, the priest, and they're very God-fearing people, they're very humble, but over time, um, Babette's there, uh, she starts to endear herself to the different villagers, the, the shopkeepers, the fishmongers, and she drives a hard bargain with fish, and she saves the sisters a lot of money. And then over time, um, they're feeding, like, the poor and the, the people who are, aren't able to, like, fend for themselves. And over time, these poor people are like, you know, this isn't, this isn't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want something better because Babette, like, makes such good food. And the, the stuff that they get, like, gruel and stuff, isn't good. And like uh, Tampopo, I just realized now that these are both title characters. Um, like yes. Tampopo, uh, Babette sort of brings joy with her yeah um and the uh this the the not there's not even subtext it's text the text of the piece is really that these super pious people are afraid that the joy they get from her cooking and yes. her presence is making them is sinful yes um and that's another sort of what if Mary Poppins ended up in a pious area instead of a instead of a guy who's ignoring his children for business? Mm-hmm. What if it was like a priest who's ignoring his or his pastor who's ignoring oh, his children, and he's like, "No, you're teaching them to have too much fun." So it's a little bit uh, what's what uh, uh, not flash dance, not flash dance. Uh, what's the one Kevin Bacon? Footloose. Footloose. It's a little bit footloose with food. Oh, God. <laughs> I didn't even see it that way. I just thought of it this minute. I didn't have that anywhere in my notes. But the dad in Footloose stays alive the whole time. Right. He dies in the early quarter of, of Babette's feast. He's right. not around. But it's, yeah, it's a little bit like, uh, the uh, yeah. But they frequently talk about the priest in conversation, like, oh, so-and-so used to say this, and we should all live like that. Right. And so uh, the feast, which is basically the last hour of the movie almost, mm-hmm. uh, Babette wins a lottery. Yes. Uh, 10,000 francs. 10,000 francs. Mm-hmm. And everybody assumes she's going to leave and she wants to throw them one final feast. Yes. And it's a proper French... In the name of their father. Yeah. Like, to like, celebrate him. It's a proper French uh, fe- uh, multi-course meal. Multi-course, correct. And the... <laughs> Uh, there's like the one really like the closest movie gets to fantasy is the nightmare sequence that yeah, one sister I'm has. Like, it's God. Yeah, oh it's like gosh. and where she's like they're gonna go to hell because they're enjoying her food too much. Mm-hmm. So they all have second thoughts about the food. Yes. But they're the way of getting around it is it would be impolite to not eat Babette's feast. Mm-hmm. But you can't like they emote. Can't, they can't emote or talk about it. Yes. And uh, the funny part is is that. While they're trying not to emote, they've also invited this former suitor of the other sister, mm-hmm. uh, who doesn't know that this is the deal they're going yes. with, and he keeps explaining how amazing this thing she's made, or how perfect the wine is. And he's like, look at them, like, it's good, right? And they're like... And they're just <laughs> trying really hard not to have any emotion. Um, and it's like, it's like the kind of thing, that if it was a movie that was directly anti-piacy they mm. would probably have ended in an orgy but oh. it, instead it's it's a movie that uh or a story that mm. is saying these people are too pious yes but they, you know they're allowed to be a, a, a little superstitious and a little overly yes. religious mm-hmm. so it really ends with them sort of accepting yes 
uh, that they are enjoying the food and that it's not sinful. And then what helps is that another part of the thing that you thought makes this movie magical is that the, the man who's a lieutenant, he's like remembering this, this restaurant he used to go into in Paris about how they had a, a chef and how a lot of these dishes are the same as, as that chef mm-hmm. that, or that restaurant that he went to. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, Ratatouille definitely had parts of Babette's Feast in mind when mm-hmm. they made it. Mm-hmm. Um, not, not, not like scene by scene, but there's a sort of, a sort of a similarity in their, their vibes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's implied that she's putting love into this food mm-hmm. and that it's helping change their hearts. Yeah. I think, I think that she has a sort of magical force. So if this is, uh, magical realism, it is light magical realism. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like, uh. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but it's like <laughs> it's like the light end of it. It's like a, a superhero movie, but it's really just a vigilante. He doesn't really have any powers. Sure. <laughs> I'm rich. <laughs> yeah, not even that. It's like 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 kick ass. It's just oh, people sure. just people taking it upon themselves, yeah. that kind of thing. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah. So though, I I uh, this was out of my comfort zone, and I was a little afraid of it because. Cause it's so well known. Never once and, said that. Once. Yeah, well, and I don't know a lot about Danish film. Uh. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm I wasn't raised Christian, so there's a lot of that stuff that goes over my head. This is almost like Orthodox, like um, yeah, just like Orthodox, like Christianity, mm-hmm. where you have to be very firm, very um. It's it'd almost be like Church of Denmark if if, if there was like a, a Church of England counterpart. Mm-hmm. They're wearing black all the time. They're very pious central uh, on on being humble and spendthrift i guess you could say and not really giving giving notice to like earthly delights right but but it, it it's not it's not a particularly challenging movie to watch unless unless you're super opposed to subtitles you just cannot stand them <laughs> uh it's it's funny in a way that you don't have to understand the cultural significance of things to get the jokes i think it won me over with its philosophy it's it's like reeking with philosophy especially at the end with yeah. its final like dinners it's very cathartic yeah the thing about the I food just dug that. and some something that happens in a uh, tom popo but not to this degree because mm-hmm. there's multiple meal eatings in tom popo yes is the way that this meal sort of builds mm-hmm. into this sort of release of happiness for yes. these characters mm-hmm. The, the 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 thing at the end is that it turns out she spent all of her money yes. that she won on this all one of these ingredients yes so she she yeah, she gave her her entire self over. Do to... you remember when I saw that's Veuve de Clicquot? I, I immediately recognized what that champagne was. Right. And the despite sh- it being you know hundreds of or a hundred years ago, I was like, oh my god, that's the same. Yeah. So it it kind of ticked one on my you know prior culinary degree experience. Like I know Veuve Clicquot on site. I know what that food is. So. Well, yeah, and so uh, as far as this is a Danish film, and we see some Danish food, and, <laughs> but it's like the bad end of Danish food. Yeah, like I, I don't, fish. Yeah. yeah, like dried pickled, dried not uh, that's right, wide they dry fish, it out. They uh, dry which it out like sticks. is like my least favorite thing in the world, <laughs> pickled or lied fish. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Um, keep it, keep it long. And uh, and bread soup that are yeah just yes. has like no flavor. So I don't think it's really representative of. Danish cuisine, but really. it's about the French cuisine. Yes. So, uh, when, with your little thing, what are the qualities of French food? Well, okay. <laughs> um, French cuisine is um, it's presented with butter, white wine, herb to Provence. I have a couple of bottles of it in mm-hmm. our own uh, um, pantry, um, using creamy and savory sauces like the mother sauces. Uh, crusty breads, onions, shallots, leeks, a little bit of garlic, not a lot. Uh, mirepoix, the trinity of celery, carrots, and onions. Capers, aged cheeses, kind of like harder cheeses. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, you have blue cheeses. Um, using saute, saute is a French word. And um, pastries and cakes that have a lot of butter, a lot of milk, a lot of fat. I actually had a, a friend at my previous office job who was taking a culinary class and he quit because he couldn't stand how much butter they had him put in things. Dude, get ready. Yeah. <laughs> he just was, he's like, nah, this isn't for me. <laughs> Not for everyone. Yeah, but Bet's Feast uh, sounds challenging based on all its awards and blah, 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 based on a novel, but it is it's easy to watch movie and really charming yeah, and you sweet. You learn stuff. Yeah, and, and again, as the outsider, um, I, 
it doesn't teach me how to make the food. No, it's extremely as, complicated. As much as like shows me alone. what goes into making the food. Yes. Um, and it looks very good, and I wanted she to. She has eat two thing. sous chefs, which is insane. Otherwise, she made everything. Yeah, and they're like they're not trained. People. No, they're just no. Um, they're they're both the there's like the 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 kids from the area, right? Yes. And then the other guy is the coachman, or. That's right. For, who for, comes with the lieutenant? Yeah. So yes. neither of them are really know no. what they're doing. They're like drinking the wine, putting, bringing the dishes to the table, and. It's not also one of those movies where you keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm -hmm. uh, like the other shoe, gonna burn. yeah, something's going to burn. Get upset. It never happens. No. It's it's just a it big exactly. release. Yeah. It's just a good fun time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's Babette's feast. So yeah, that's our first argument on on how much it fits the idea of magical realism. <laughs> um, the next movie is the last one we watched, and we almost didn't watch it. It was kind mm -hmm. of a last-minute thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of my favorites that I wasn't sure if counted as a food movie. Oh, it does. Uh, is uh, Peter Greenaway's The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover. Uh, actually, I actually have a couple, two personal stories about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, twice in my life, someone asked me to borrow the DVD. I guess it's, it's, it went out of print a long time ago, um, and people have heard of it. And... Both times, people returned it to me and were very angry at me as if I had made the film and made them borrow it. <laughs> because it is a very it's harsh very film. Fresh. Yeah, it's a harsh, harsh film. Mm -hmm. um, and the other story I have is when it came out in 1989, I think it probably didn't hit the U.S. until 90. Yeah, it took a while. Um, so, it, it's a, it's, so I should say the last film was a Danish film about French cuisine, and this is going to be a... Uh, UK film about French cuisine as well. Yes. Um, it came out and it, it there was it basically it the idea that at the end someone is cooked and eaten mm -hmm. was uh, I think it was Siskel and Ebert that sort of just spoiled that for everybody. Yes. And so I remember being at the dinner table. We would go to my grandparents every Sunday when I was a kid. So I would have been nine or ten, and uh, my grandfather saying he really he went and saw it and loved it. And my mom, only really knowing that it was an X-rated or NC-17 rated mm -hmm. movie where someone is eaten, thought it was just... And she, how could you have enjoyed this movie about eating people? I don't understand. And she was so upset. So in my little mind, I just thought the whole movie was about eating people. Mm -hmm. And I ended up seeing the movie Delicatessen by Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Genet and uh, Jean Caro which is not really a food movie. It kept on being on lists I would see online. I just don't think of it as a food movie. Right. Um, which is about cannibalism. And I think I thought that was the movie they were talking about. And then I finally found a copy of The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, Lover, which was edited. I knew there was an R-rated edit. I didn't know until just yesterday that they cut almost 30 minutes out of the you movie. so much. <laughs> I don't know how, but the blockbuster version, I'm glad I never went to that. So I've always seen the uncut version. Mm -hmm. But I remember waiting, the being like a teenager... Or it's probably like, yeah, 1918. Uh, and waiting for them to eat somebody. It's literally <laughs> the last thing that happens in the movie. It's the yes. end of the movie. It's probably four minutes of... Actually, the actual eating is one bite that he can't mm -hmm. even swallow. So I just remember being like, what? Um, but this is, a, this is one of those movies that's been a favorite for a long time that I never really thought about critically. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about why I liked it or what it means. Because it's Peter Greenaway... Uh, I've never really sat down with any of his other movies, but they're dense. I know they're, they're dense. For sure. I read a little blippet in the 1001 Movies to Read Before You Die that describes it as a, a movie about Thatcherism, mm -hmm. but doesn't explain anything beyond that. So I'm like, okay, it's about Thatcherism. This time I watched it, this is about Thatcherism. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, a, it's about a... They don't say exactly what kind of... The thief quote, the thief, the Michael Gambon character, mm -hmm. is some sort of, of mafia type guy. Yes. Like, not very high level. Not really, no. Um, and so he is representative of... He thinks of, he's high level. Yeah. He's representative of a shitty politician, a shitty Tory politician, mm -hmm. basically. Sort of. Um, <laughs> and he is a blowhard. He never shuts up. Mm -hmm. And he... Uh, thinks he's super xenophobic to the point where he thinks everybody wants to talk but there's actually a lot of donald trump in him i noticed I the way he too. has to keep talking yes like the way that when you see trump talking and it, 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 he just keeps yammering yes and people just cheer every once in a while like mm -hmm. and so like he's just yammering and people are just sitting around him and which is not something I, as a i don't think of that as being a thatcher thing but i guess thatcher people were that way sure i don't know i didn't live in the uk in the 80s but um 
so I kind of got that xenophobia stuff, but then like this idea that these upper crust people who are running things, because he has bought this restaurant, yes, uh, run by this Frenchman, and he goes there every day with his mm-hmm. poor wife, who we we know he physically and sexually abuses and berates, yes. um, and he and he forces all these people to just sit down with him and just listen to him talk constantly. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, and he talks about what makes good food, and he doesn't know what he's saying. He just wants the expensive food. The best of everything. Yes. He tries to buy... Um, flatware. Flatware. And he gets, like, crappy gold mm-hmm. flatware because it looks flashy, but it just breaks. Yes. Um, so, yeah, he doesn't really know anything. Um, and so she'll, the chef will make her, like, a very special, simple-looking, but... Like I, a terrain almost. Yeah, and he'll make fun of it because it's not what he considers fancy, which I suppose would be something that, that your boorish right-wing people would be like in the 80s. I, I vaguely remember that being the case in, in America, that you had, you had stuff like sushi became something that conservative It was like the, the dusk or like the sunset of like steakhouses. Yeah. Where your food had to be really big and really like in your face and like you had to have a full belly versus gourmet and french things you're you're satisfied but it's small amounts of food set in literally they had a days of the week course by course menu of what they were being fed but i think also something happened in the 80s in america when we were growing up mm-hmm. um i had a i had a i had an uncle that was a verified yuppie mm-hmm. and the way he treated food and that's part of why sushi started to become popular yes. it was very expensive mm-hmm. And it was a status symbol. And it's like, and and I think that a lot of what in this, so the cook in this is sort of just going along with it, but he's not enjoying it. The other thing is that um, he's aware of, um, like, he's pervaded by these people. Yes. And um, they're paying off, like, critics and um, different people that say they're against, like, uh, code violations. Right. There's food rotting all around them in, like, these huge lorry trucks. And people are being paid not to look at them. Yeah, he, um, the, the the movie starts with the the gangster, the Michael Gambone character, having acquired, quote unquote, mm-hmm. all of this meat. Yes. That he didn't ask for, that the chef did not ask for. Mm-hmm. And uh, the chef won't use it. Yeah. So it just sits out back rotting. Mm-hmm. And it sort of becomes representative of the rot of the movie. Oh, good. So yeah. on a... On a meta level, like we haven't even gotten into the the his <laughs> wife and her lover part of the story, but on a meta level, it's it's about this shitty, horrible person who is in power mm-hmm. and exerts his power more and more and keeps ruining this place of art. Mm-hmm. He, he has this big garish sign. Mm-hmm. He has a friend of his who's a higher up criminal guy of some type yes. that suggests they have entertainment. Mm-hmm. So he uses his pimp guy, who's played by a fucking sexy Syrian Hines. So, Jesus he's Christ. Like this awesome. He's like a he's like a musketeer. He's I, got, I saw him as being like um a traveler or like a gypsy oh, or he's like beautiful facial hair and Mick long Fleetwood hair. Sort of like let me lure you away with my loot sort of man. Yeah. Um oh, but he's a pimp so apparently. Yeah. I didn't realize he was playing a pimp. He gets the pimp to bring it. So he's ruining it with this horrible floor show but mm-hmm. uh, um uh sex workers who are not no. singers being no. brought in to sing. So, you know, there's a little bit of snobbery behind, I think, what Greenaway is trying to say about uh, art mm-hmm. and how people are ruining art with, with lower art, I think, is kind of going on, too, which I don't like. Yeah. But there's still the better meta-commentary that the people in power who don't know what they're talking about, who have all the money and power, mm-hmm. are ruining everybody else's time. Yeah, and they're turning their back on the people who work in the back of house who almost look like they're slaving away. And yeah. This, there's like this Oliver character who's like the chorus for for some of the um, for some of the parts where they go back in the kitchen. He's like you know singing he, so sadly. About he sings things. a specific psalm that I don't remember what it was, but mm-hmm. yeah, he's singing a specific psalm over and over again. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so as the movie carries on, he gets a bigger and bigger entourage, but then he starts getting paranoid about losing power and losing power over things, specifically his wife. Yes. And he goes, gets angrier and more and more violent until Mm his, by the end of the movie, his entire thing has shrunk to basically his mother and his stupidest... That was his mom? I believe that's supposed to be his mom. Okay, yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that's supposed to be his mom. She does say, like, my Albert a couple times. Yeah. And his stupidest henchman played by 
uh, Tim Roth. Still sexy, though. Yeah, but he supposed, he's supposed to be like a boy. Yeah. The idea of the Tim Roth character is supposed to just... like. There's a point when um, when Hill and Mirren, who plays the wife, says... Like, he says, you're being rude to Tim Roth. Mm -hmm. And she says, he's just mimicking you like he always does. Exactly. And so I think Tim Roth's supposed to represent all the idiots who don't really know what they're or saying. Or coming about, up in politics. And, or, and who just listen to the xenophobic stuff and just absorb it and take mm -hmm. it in. And then do horrible things in their name i mean for they they could stand for the weird national front skinhead people that they had in the uk in the Possibly. 80s this take i mean this is made in 89 so we're at the end of thatcherism and i mm -hmm. don't think that 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 skinhead thing was quite as big then but Not really, no. i mean tim roth did actually play a a british skinhead and right. and i can't remember what that movie was called but Me neither. that was one of his earliest big roles mm -hmm. um so i could see that being that so anyway Yes, game. The other part of the story is his wife and his and her lover. Yes. So, Helen Mirren plays the wife, and she's. She looks amazing all the time. Yeah, I mean this is eighty nine, but she's still she's probably in her mid to late forties by now. I don't know. Possibly. How old she is. I have no Couldn't idea. even guess. Who don't, could guess how care. old Helen Mirren don't is? Don't care. <laughs> at any given time in her career, um, but she's this put upon abused woman, mm -hmm. uh, and we find out later she's even tried to run away. Yes. She's just, uh, she is a, a a very, for how outrageous the movie is, she's a pretty typical stand-in for an abused spouse. Yes. Um, and she and sort she's of... she's had to, like, harden herself yes. against her husband. And there's a, another patron who's always at the restaurant, who mm -hmm. the lover, um, who... Uh, always reading books. Is always reading books. He's bookish. And so it's another, it's another case of, I think, Greenaway being a little bit of a, a snob, like... This guy only cares about these things, but this guy cares about the finer things in life. Books. And Spica audibly says, like, why do you care about books? Yeah. There's no point in this. This is a bunch of, yeah, he doesn't care. Yeah. So the two of them sort of make eye contact yes. and then awkwardly run into each other at the bathroom. Which is a different color than the dining room. Yeah, I haven't even gotten into the visuals yet. <laughs> um, they run into each other at the bathroom, they end up starting an affair, and then every night, since they eat every night of the week at this place... Mm -hmm. Um, they have a new affair, and the uh, chef, um, who is, uh, I believe, Richard uh, Bohringer, uh, in his name is Richard in the actual movie. Yes. There was a story that they were going to name all the characters after the actors, but, um, and so the lover is named Michael, because Michael Gambon was going to play that character, mm -hmm. but he kind of aged out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the Gambon character's named Albert, because it was going to be um, Albert Finney. Yeah, Albert Finney. Mm -hmm. And uh, they start, yeah, they start an affair. Mm -hmm. That's what most people think is the uh, NC-17 part of the movie. It's it's basically just full frontal nudity. It's yeah. not particularly uh, racy, honestly. No. It's sexy. It's Absolutely. pretty, but it's not like it's not like X-rated by any means. So, mm -hmm. I don't think um, so. I remember being thought that was kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so they carry on this affair. And, the, yeah, the staff is basically helping them with the affair. Yes. And they get found out, and then they have to escape, and they run away, and they hide. That's That part that you're talking about and, and kind of, like, rushing past is what makes me think it's, like, Shakespearean. Because the the girl who is um, with uh, Corey the Pimp, uh, Syrian Hines, she notices them through a window and says, "Oh, I do believe our 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 um we're going to go up a little bit higher in this, in this gang because I see something that um the the boss speaker needs to know about." And so she tells him, and Corey is just really well. She actually like, tells him out of anger though, because he's insulting correct. her. He ins also, he insults Shakespearean. Him. Yeah, <laughs> the girls are, are are just wanting to like. Um, to like speak the truth and, and say what they've seen and the men are like no you don't understand this inner hierarchy but eventually the husband finds out and goes to their den of, of love making and um, while he sends the again this is just social experience that he sends her away to somewhere else to check on the kid who was hurt or was attacked by his gang and then he goes and yeah the, the boy the, the Oliver boy is yes. bringing them food at their love nest and mm -hmm is attacked and and really it's almost the hardest to watch scene in the movie is because yes. this, this kid they got this kid who can actually sing and so he can mm -hmm. scream too mm -hmm. um and, and it's again it's another case where they don't show you anything but it's implied it's heartbreaking when he goes ah yeah. just the, the highest part of the scream is just yeah. like gosh he's going through terrible stuff 
And well, and then if you're saying it's Shakespearean, you think of plays, yes. and it's set up like a play. And I think that's why I always liked it, even Very before open, I thought about huge it. Very frame staging, a curtain closing at the end. Yes. Yeah, it's a huge, basically it's like they took a giant stage and they built upon it, I think I count six stages. Mm -hmm. There might be seven if the place where they're making love in the kitchen is a separate set, but I'm not sure if it is. Mm. But it's basically the outside behind, mm -hmm. uh, which is, and the costumes change with every room. Yes. So outside behind is a sort of sickly area where there's rabid dogs and all the meat rotting. Mm -hmm. And that's where the sexual abuse happens. Yes. And they always wear green back there. No, they wear green. The, they wear the, blue, blue and black back there. That's right. Correct. And then they wear green in the kitchen. Green in the kitchen, which is mostly green colored. It's mm -hmm. interesting because it has such high ceiling, way higher than a kitchen would be. Yes. It's the one that looks the most like a set, I think. Yes. You can see like the rafters and stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they got it into the dining room is red and everybody will be wearing red. Mm -hmm. And the bathroom is white and they'll be wearing white. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's some sort of irony on virginalism because they have sex in the bathroom or but... because porcelain is white yeah <laughs> and there's a men and women's bathroom where the only difference is the yeah. the urinals no difference. um and then there's the 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 bookkeeper michael's um his store which mm -hmm. is just it's a book it's a whole bunch of books mm -hmm. and it's brownish but nobody wears clothes there no <laughs> And so it so it has these sets and the and it, so it's very stagey, mm -hmm. and there'll be camera tricks in between. There'll be very long takes and very few close ups. Yes. The close ups are I mean, like the, a lot fewer than you see, and a lot fewer cuts. Cuts usually for only, uh, either for point of view is the most common cut. Not a lot of cuts in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it can, and the camera will stay on the same axis for a lot of the movie, where it will just be pulled alongside as if it is in front of the stage being True. pulled from one side to the mm -hmm. other left or right mm -hmm. um and then when you do go to a close-up it's sort of uh it's sort of jarring almost yes it is um and then the like the book suppository suppository <laughs> <laughs> the book depository well it becomes suppository when he's being killed which yeah. is one of the questions i wanted to ask ask you actually uh -huh. if you had to choose what book would you want to be choked to death with? well okay so yeah he's captured and he's murdered by uh, and actually, as things are going on, this is where Gambone starts losing his gang. Yes. Because first he attacks a child and some mm -hmm. of them leave. They're and, really upset. And then he gets Tim Roth to get a spoon, a wooden spoon, and shove pages, pages of a book mm -hmm. down Michael's throat until mm -hmm. it kills him. And Helen Mirren is like, that's his favorite book. Yeah, it's the French to... Revolution. I have no idea what you would cram to... Uh, my favorite book? I wouldn't want to be killed by my favorite book. That's why I was like, what, like, symbolic book? Like, if it could be a book that, like, ends the author's career, what would you want it to be? <laughs> I, oh, God. Like, some, like, book by some weird right-wing... That's what I was thinking. I was yeah. like, Bill O'Reilly book. That would no, be Beyond famous. Him. Like, beyond? one of the really crazy ones. <laughs> it, yeah. But, so, yeah, he dies, and she... Mm -hmm. Um, she confesses as he, to his dead body all the horrible things she's been through. Yes. Then convinces uh, the chef to cook him and mm -hmm. may enforce uh, Albert to eat him. That's when I was like really like in awe of the open stage sort of concept because they pull back really far and you can see this huge table mm -hmm. that they are just directly in the middle of. And it, it seems like it kind of embodies her her plight and what she wants the chef to do is like I know this is a big deal and you shouldn't do this mm -hmm. this is what how I want um how I want to have revenge on my husband and he doesn't want to do it until he thinks that she wants to Im to imbibe her lover correct She's like, and no. then as soon as he figures out oh then he's in with it and then yeah the another thing about the stage design is at the end everybody comes back like mm -hmm. every member of the cast comes yeah. back and it's just him Tim Roth and his mom and yes. everybody else who he's who's life who hates him now mm -hmm. on the other side, right? And so you can have this wide shot with all of these people. Yes. Um, yeah. So, I kind of feel like I get what makes it. And for me, and so the note I made myself, and I think the other thing I really like about it mm -hmm. is that um, I feel like it's a movie about contrasts too, visually mm -hmm. speaking at least. And so it's the contrast between the colors. The contrast between divine and grotesque, so yeah. beautiful food and then people vomiting yes. and rotten food, people having sex, people being murdered. 
Yes. Um, there's a contrast between Albert and Michael, obviously. Michael mm-hmm. doesn't even speak for the first half hour, half hour of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the contrast between his silence and the empty boasts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and sex and violence. Like, I think that's... Because it's such an extreme movie in that standpoint, I think that's what I've always liked about it, too. Mm-hmm. Since this uh, deals with as much of about uh, French cooking as Babette's Feast did, I was like kind of scrambling at first like what am I gonna like talk about as being like highlighted ingredients and I'm like of course it's right in front of me he talks all about how uh, expensive food is the best food mm-hmm. so I'm like what are expensive ingredients um, it's like shelled seafood lobster caviar uh, wagyu beef foie gras saffron vanilla um, I a big one that I didn't expect was barnacles Pe- people pay a lot for barnacles I guess you have to get them off a whale or ships, or <laughs> something that's tasty. maybe they're better depending on what they're stuck to. Exactly. I've never had a barnacle. I have no idea. I've never met a barnacle. I didn't. Know. <laughs> and then um, the fresh like shoots of like or or stalks of hop, like you know hops that you make beer out of. You really just use like this kind of like fluffy bit, like at the end of a piece of wheat or something. Mm-hmm. But the shoots of it, the fresh part of it, like imagine a bamboo shoot but having it be like of a hop that the actual freshness of it because it's not aged because it's not like brewed it's it's very expensive um other than that i bear oh ham pork coffee the civet coffee that's pooped out and then you just harvest that <laughs> gross yeah you, you know civet coffee um well truffles are the thing i always know about. truffles for sure yeah shark fin bird's nest and then gold leaf obviously because gold is expensive and really it's about food that's prized for um, how rare it is, how hard it is to find and procure and age. Um, the har- specific har- harvest times, specific like hybridization of, of different things and grown specific seasons. And then I realized or I noticed that there was a point where um, Michael Gambon or, or speaker was talking about black foods are expensive. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, like you said, um, truffles are black. They can be black sometimes. White ones are a little bit more rare. But then there's also, I, I looked it up, there's also black caviar, but there's also black watermelon and mm. black chicken. Is I've seen weird. black chicken before, yeah. Yeah, they're just like stark black and their meat is almost black. Um, yeah, and that scene that she asked the chef while she's trying to get him to cook Michael's dead body, she's yes. asking him what the most expensive foods are. Mm-hmm. And he does bring up diet foods, too. That's right, he does. And I think that's supposed to be a dig in general at, uh, at that yuppie cuisine of, of that, by, you know, they were going into the 90s at this point. There mm-hmm. wasn't as much of the yuppie cuisine, but the middle 80s had mm-hmm. all of this. Small portion sizes. Small portion sizes, just mm-hmm. like uh, a food that, not that, not that uh, food fads are an inherently 80s thing, but <laughs> that particular decades food fads were a lot of diet things that didn't need to be expense as expensive right. as they were um yeah and after uh, albert dies the camera uh, the, the 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 curtain literally comes down mm-hmm. so and it's a f- sort of fantasy world so i i don't this one's uh the magical realism aspect <laughs> is really more in the way it's presented yes and the fact that people's clothing changes colors mm-hmm. between shots mm-hmm. um and that again it has this sort of fairy tale vibe to it but you, what you call Shakespearean, I think also of as fairy tale, where like the evil, evil king and his queen and his queen escapes with the, and they go to a tower and yeah. she has to get revenge. And, I agree with that. Yeah. So that brings us to 1992's Like Water for Chocolate. Mm-hmm. This is a Mexican movie. I saw so much of my family in this movie. Yeah. Uh, Alfonso Arau, Arau, A-R-A-U. And right. then I recognized him when he was on screen at the very beginning. I said, hey, Gabe, is that El Guapo from Three Amigos? And I'm like, no, this is some, like, art house dude. And I looked it up. No, uh, <laughs> this man has had one of the most fascinating <laughs> careers I can think of. Uh, he, he did the voice of Ka in the Spanish dub of The Jungle Book. Mm, and then cool. 50 years later, he voiced Papa Julio in uh, Coco. Um, nice. He was featured players in The Wild Bunch and El Topo, because they filmed in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, he had uh, supporting important, big supporting roles in 80s comedies, Used Cars, 
Romancing the Stone, as you said, Three Amigos. Mm-hmm. Um, and assuming we don't have the guy who played El Wapo in Three Amigos on his gravestone when he passes, <laughs> I think he'll probably be best remembered for directing this, uh, Like Water for Chocolate, which is a sort of... It, this one is based on a book and is described as, um, as magical realism. So this one, this is one we can't really argue because that's its descriptor. <laughs> yeah, says you... Well, I mean, no, no, literally, that's what the book is called. It, that's the genre of book that it's okay. based on. Is, um, and uh, anyway, uh, this is, this is the type of movie that really came out of the early mid '90s that like, would just sort of there was something about that area where where it was it was in part because of a fucking Harvey Weinstein, but there was a way of selling certain foreign films as important things to watch. Yes. And so they would actually make quite a bit of money in America. Mm-hmm. And this was one of them. I remember my mother being a huge fan of this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually letting me watch it on video, which I was sort of surprised by. Until we watched it and I realized it has a lot of nudity in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the sex isn't particularly graphic. It's sort of Not loving really. sex. So I guess she wasn't bothered by that. Uh, Something I noticed about the style too is that it's a lot of reminiscing about your family that you never really knew. Like... Um, how like family members or ancestors are can do like impossible things and it's like a tall tale they're like oh they could cook as as good as anybody and they went through such hardships but they got through it and um you could taste someone's like love or someone's sadness or anger in their food Mm -hmm. and yeah that's the that's well, there's also ghosts in this movie. Yes. But the basic idea, the thing that makes it magical realism, is that uh, the main character, uh, who is uh, Tita, played by Lumi Cavazos, um, who I I recognized the whole time we were watching it. I finally figured out she's in Bottle Rocket. That was the other thing I had oh, seen her. Oh, I see. Um, she uh, can magically imbue the food she makes with her emotions. Mm-hmm. I don't know if she realizes that she does it, though. No, I'm not sure either. But it's very much like a fairy tale in that she is... This movie is like... Whereas Tampopo has a a bit of a Pygmalion vibe, this Mm -hmm. has a Cinderella vibe. Of sorts. Where it's not her stepmother, but it is her evil, shitty mother. And it's it's based on, like, birth order. I mean, coming from a a half-Mexican background, there's, like, specific roles that you need Mm -hmm. to fulfill based on your birth order, being the oldest, being the youngest, her being the middle? No, oh, she was the youngest. Youngest. Yeah. Um, she has to take care of her mother as she ages. Yeah. If she cannot marry, she cannot get involved with anyone. Her only goal throughout her life is to take care of her mom. Which is very Cinderella-esque, where Cinderella is adopted by this uh, woman who values her children above her, mm-hmm. and she just acts as their housekeeper the near borderline slave the entire time and she basically sells off the oldest child to someone that the youngest is interested in yes. in order to like kind of thwart it off like you know he's taken you can't mess with him but no for the rest of their marriage she pines for the guy yeah um this is a uh it, it's a it's it's another one that because it's based on a book, it's very uh, sort of episodic in the way it kind of moves mm-hmm. through the story. Um, and it, but I don't think it's a bad. It does this bad. I only really noticed it at the end when it was um, uh, their child and his the the love affair's daughter getting married. That I'm like, time is really pushed forward. There's yeah, no it ends very least, abruptly. It's suddenly the '30s now. It's <laughs> this 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 had to have been fast forwarding over something. Yeah, and uh, and there yeah there's certain I mean it, if it if it has a weakness it is in probably the editing I would say possibly uh, just the way the story getting in goes, mm-hmm. um, and the okay oh I kind of forgot to mention the last one, uh, m- from my point of view is food uh, it does not sh- really show you how the food is made. They put no. the people's right there. No. This one takes time to show you how the food is made. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a sort of con- uh, 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 instructive way. Yeah, I mean, that's the way that the 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 descendant is looking at it. She's looking through the recipes that her, right. her aunt wrote, and then 
a lot of it is um, from the perspective of also um, nannies and, and maids being like family to, to children more in a way than their mother could ever right. be. And um, having them follow you throughout their life out of sheer like, you know, loyalty. Like this, this maid or this, this, um, this uh, cook is, is meant to be with me and mm -hmm. follow me through into this marriage from my childhood. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, I haven't, we haven't really been talking about the plot much more because that really is the plot. It's mm -hmm. the youngest daughter is born into this family. Uh, she's not allowed to marry. She loves a boy. The boy is married off to her older sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, the older sister dies because she sort of curses, uh, curses the food she's given her. And it curses her bowels. Yeah. Um... And then she ends up with she ends up sent away, mm -hmm. and sort of is going to marry this other guy who's very sweet, but they don't really a have doctor. A, a very sweet doctor that they don't really she's not really attracted to, but she's mm -hmm. comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Um, in Texas, he's up in Texas. And what is it before they leave or while they're in Texas? The um, there's like um, uh, uh, Mexican like uh, convicts or like. These, like, it's bandits. Men. It's it's occurring during the um, the Sp uh, Mexican Revolution. It's like nineteen ten, mm. and uh, I don't think the story is particularly pro revolution. It's because there are like bandits running around that that yes. uh, kill her mother basically. That's true. And so her mother's ghost then starts haunting her, mm -hmm. saying, "You better not." take away your there sister's there is so much mexican symbolism and superstition at play that i'm like of course of course her mom's there yeah and there are times where i'm like this don't you know about this <laughs> this this always happens and like someone's dooming you from beyond the grave and and how symbolic that is and then what what i meant to bring up by bringing up the bandits is that her um her middle sister her um the one old, slightly older than her the redhead um is taken away by the bandits and yeah. then the rest of the family including her older sister kind of writes her off like oh she's a whore oh she's a prostitute she's in a bordello but then she comes back and she's the queen of the cowboys yeah i wrote down queen of the yeah, cowboys yeah she's in charge of her of their part i guess it's not <sighs> I love an, that part. it's not anti uh revolution now that i think no. about it no is she and she's sort of yeah Queen of the revolutionaries. Yes. She's their leader at this point. Yeah. And, and how easy her life is. And she sort of represents what could have gone better. And that, yes. And that helps push her sister to, mm -hmm. uh, be, you know, become her own person and s stop dealing with the uh, literal ghost of her mother. Mm -hmm. um, sure. It's a. Uh, it's also sort of like Water for Chocolate is. It, I can, another reason I can see why it was popular is it's a bit of a bodice ripper. Yes. And it's, you know, culturally exotic, but not out, like, outrageously culturally exotic. It's, like, something people can... It's something that that middle-class moms can go see in mm -hmm. 1992. And uh, it's super sincere, uh, but its sex is never really sleazy, and its sincerity is never silly. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of fairy tale quality kind of lets it be a little bit more sincere it's than It's very that. Mexican in that way. yeah. I feel like a lot of uh, historical fiction from this era would not l let itself be quite so whimsical. No. Or at least the era after. Especially Maybe that was with, a 90s like, thing. the constraints of family and what you're meant to do. Right. And, like, the, the wrong side of living and the correct, proper Catholic side. Right. And, you know, I grew up in southern Arizona, so I know pretty well about Mexican cuisine, but... <laughs> Mole was a big thing in this, and I do not like mole. <laughs> she made a wedding cake. Um, yeah. She made like some sort of soup for the. The soup did look pretty good. <laughs> it probably had a lot of tripe in it, but it was still. You think, always think Mexican food has tripe in it. Well, soups do. Well, and then you, you always like uphold taco places that have tripe on their menu. That's yeah. Like, if they can do tripe. If you go into a taco or burrito place and they have t beef tongue and tripe on their menu, yes. you don't have to eat it. Just I, know that I don't there. really like those things. But the fact that it's there means that their other stuff is going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be really good. Like, in most cases. I suppose if you're in an area that already has a million Mexican restaurants, you might you might not have a great one. But. Mm -hmm. If you're out in the Midwest, that's a pretty good indication of a good taco place. Absolutely. Uh, th well, that's all I have on that movie. Did you 
have any else? The ingredients, of course. Okay, so that's what, yeah. So, <laughs> do you, are you getting ingredients of mole? Uh, not quite. Um, that's just chocolate and... It's dark chocolate. Dark chocolate and salt? <laughs> it's a sauce. There's more to it's it It's sauce? That. Okay. Dried and fresh peppers, tomatoes, younger cheeses, softer cheeses, like... Um, Oh, we, we always get cotilla, mm -hmm. um, cilantro, cumin, corn slash masa slash tequila, all corn-based things, rice, beans, red and white meats, seafood, cacao slash dark chocolate, that's the mole for you, mm -hmm. um, embracing the salty, sour, and smoky, uh, balio bread, they had bread a few times, mm -hmm. and um, they usually had it for breakfast, and quick breads like tortillas. Yeah, it's sort of like, it's, it's a pretty direct i mean mexico is a big country so there are different cuisines throughout it yes for sure um, different focuses on seafood if you're by the coast yeah but it, and, and then it focuses is a desert so chili peppers make sense because those can grow mm -hmm. um, and you can age them and dry them to make yeah. them hotter yeah but the things you really think about as mexican food a lot of them are indigenous cultures food mm -hmm. mixed with spanish cultures food. yeah and they had a, a mocajete for grinding things and that mm -hmm. i recognized right away and that's something that happens in, like, Central America, quote-unquote, where mm -hmm. there's a lot of corn, a lot of grinding. And I think they had corn flour being made, like, with on a wheel. I don't remember that, but I'm sure it was there. I do I definitely remember the grinding. Mm -hmm. That's something we actually did in school once when I was a it's kid. It's a lot Summer of school. work. Yeah, it wasn't fun. I really <laughs> thought it was going to be fun when we were, given, we were given the corn and we were told to grind it. Mm -hmm. I can make my own tortillas. Why don't I even need to buy them anymore? Yes. And like two minutes into it, I'm like, nah. There's a reason. No, no thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So then we're going to just barely jump out of this one decade period for our last mm -hmm. two movies. They both were released in 96, so okay. we were very close. That's fine. To being at exact decade <laughs> would have been crazy. <laughs> um, but the one that I needed to cover the most, because it's one of my favorites, mm -hmm. is uh, um, Stephen Chow's The God of Cookery, which is, uh, I, I believe he had one movie between this and Shaolin Soccer, but this one really feels like him getting ready for Shaolin Soccer. Yes. Dealing with more special effects, uh, changing his pace, aiming. Uh, I mean, it's still a lot of wordplay, but uh, mm -hmm. his earlier movies that he made himself... Uh, he actually was in a lot of other people's movies. Yeah. There's so much wordplay that they're actually difficult to. It's like region specific. Yeah, like, like inside jokes. Like I, 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 obviously, I don't speak Cantonese, so it's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sure pissing fish balls is hilarious to them. But yeah. I'm just like, what? Why do you want well, to do that? And so it's like, but this is it's it's. I think that I like Shell and Soccer more, but this mm -hmm. is, this is a a very quintessential. Uh, 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 Stephen Chow movie. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can see all of his sort of uh, trademarks in this movie. It, it's about a guy who is the sort of celebrity battle cook. Mm -hmm. So that's um, taking off of Iron Chef. But he has like endorsements, right. and he like leads uh, specific conferences and helps open up stores and cuts the ribbon and. He has lots of uh, flunkies and underlings who like bow to his every whim, and including I, one guy who wants to take over. Right, and and so that well, that's the basis of the story. Is it's just as Shell and Soccer is just really the Bad News Bears yes. with a different thing put on it. I couldn't place exactly what this. I swear to God, this there is a movie that has this plot, and I just couldn't <laughs> place it. It's probably another sports movie. It could but be. This sort of blowhard um, rises to the top and is is blind to his weaknesses and is knocked down to the bottom mm -hmm. and has to build Literally his way into back the up streets. and has to build his way back up in a more um honest way yes i suppose that that's i was that's a little bit uh that's a little bit bad news bears in itself actually mm -hmm. uh or he doesn't quite make a team right um he has to better himself mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh but so it has all those trademarks of his movies which are um uh, he's spoofing something in pop culture, mm -hmm. and I had to look into this, uh, and apparently he is spoofing, uh, there was a movie called The Chinese Feast by Chewy Hark okay. that was super mega popular the year before, and that kind of came out of Ang Lee had made a couple of movies in Taiwan, uh, The Wedding Banquet, mm -hmm. and I think that Eat, Drink, Man, Woman is 
also a Taiwanese one. I cannot remember if that was one was made in America. But these are very popular international, just like uh, like Water for Chocolate movies that made that did well in America. Yes. They were sold well, and they were released at a proper time. When uh, does Iron Chef come into play? I think the way I could figure it out, Iron Chef had existed since the mid-'80s, and this okay. is 96. Mm -hmm. So Iron Chef was a thing, and Celebrity Chefs were a thing. Mm -hmm. So he kind of combined those two ideas with... And then wanted to make fun of these banquet movies that are like these big drama comedies. They're all about people gathering around a big meal. Yes. Um, like the movie Soul Food is a kind of idea like, mm -hmm. like that. Only that's, and a you're funeral. that's like a funeral banquet. You're ultimately talking more about the weaknesses of the family during these dinners yeah. too. Yeah, and, and it's like a way of people breaking, especially the Ang Lee movies are a way of, of breaking down tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, versus uh, newer ways of thinking. You're talking about things you withheld for so long and that you always wanted to say to your right. parents or grandparents. But but you couldn't because tradition just dictated you. Had to but just now at dinner. Day. Right, oh. and so that I can see God of Cookery being about tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's almost the opposite where tradition kind of fixes the problem because and then he learns he, humility through tradition. <laughs> correct, and then like street food comes into play too where he really kind of gets up and learns from other people too. Right, Um and so, uh, yeah, he's making fun of that. And then he has um, nods to uh, John Woo movies in particular. Uh, there's a bunch of nods to uh, uh, visual nods to the A Better Tomorrow movies. Mm, okay. Uh, the way he's lighting things, the way people are walking down hallways in slow yes. motion, stuff like that. Exactly. Um, and then he, uh, apparently there was a series, I've never actually seen the God of Gambler series, which he starred in, hmm. uh, but didn't write. Uh, God What's of Capri, that about? God, it's about a guy who's a gambler. <laughs> So I think that there was a bit of using the title. It doesn't have supernatural shit going on. Um, he was not in a lot of kung fu type movies. There was a couple um, that he didn't direct that he was in. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one has uh, also Shaw Brothers thing. After he is knocked down, it's sort of his his manager and this new upstart sort of knock him off the top. Yes. And he ends up in... in, in the street and learns from a uh, sort of street vendor lady mm -hmm. who is another character he would recycle a million times. It's the same thing that happens in a Shell and Soccer, an, an attractive street vendor mm -hmm. who is uh, actually very attractive and a very s special person who he is ignoring. He always is casting himself as the one that as he casts himself as assholes, except for in Shell and Soccer, he's not quite an asshole, but mostly as <laughs> assholes who um, have to learn to be better people. I think he's an asshole in both this and Shell and Soccer in the sense that he like slaps these women or like tells them off and they, they still love him so much right. and just really like take after him. And so it's like halfway between taking the piss out of himself. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know exactly how big of a star he would have been at this point. Maybe this would have been like, like uh, a Brad Pitt making a movie about himself, where oh, everybody gosh. loves Brad Pitt, but then figuring out that he likes the wrong person. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so he and this woman, he collaborates with these two street vendor sort of like there's gangs that involve. Yes. It's one of these universes that revolves around. I kind of got a um, uh, um, Michael Jackson's bad from like different street vendors like fighting each other with food or with food knowledge. Um. And so he learns from them, and then uh, he's still being a prick, yeah. and he en and he ends up. They try uh, his enemies are trying to assassinate him, and he ends up at uh, the Shaolin, a uh, Shaolin uh, golden, golden Shaolin place, and insults the, uh, the, the head monk, and so he's left there for six months. Yes. And there's this hilarious series of sequences where he keeps trying to escape the monastery mm -hmm. and they find him they beat the shit out of him and drag him bloody back inside <laughs> it's the exact same shot every time um and all that stuff's making fun of shaw brothers movies which mm -hmm. would have been a couple decades old by then so it, it it's like god tier slapstick stuff like it is ultimate just the greatest slapstick that you put in movies are in these Chow families, and they're a little bit mean spirited. Oh shit! Different Chow. <laughs> Stephen St Stephen Chow. Stephen Chow. Not Chen Fat. Uh, Stephen Chow. Uh, uh, he he also has this mean streak, and this sort of 
he finds uh, wretched people really funny. Mm-hmm. Just the more wretched, the wretched, the better. Mm-hmm. And he finds just humiliating people really funny. Yeah. The good guys and the bad guys. That's true. And, the, and so he learns, he finds Zen basically at the monastery and comes mm-hmm. back and does basically an Iron Chef battle yes. that involves um, Buddhist palm techniques. That's and, right. And this is against the, the new god of the Right. Country. And so... Um, and then and the movie ends with literal God of Cookery as like this sort of angel character yes. coming in and saying that it's been, that this contest has not been correctly judged. And mm-hmm. yeah, a deus ex machina to the extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, this is, this is a movie that's just, I wish it, we watched it on my crappy DVD. There's yeah, just no good that versions That kind of put of it, it down a little bit. Yeah. It brought down the quality and like the, the, what I took from it is that it was so much like uh, Food Wars. Yeah. Um, the god of cookery is basically the god tongue. or um, Food Wars being this Japanese cartoon. Yes. Is it available on Netflix? Uh, or Hulu? Netflix, a couple seasons. Hulu, a few more seasons. There's there's um, some of um, some different... Uh, Crunchyroll? Crunchyroll has um, uncaptioned, uh, undubbed options um but you have to deal with commercials mm-hmm. if you don't have a subscription anyway um with the judgment and and people eating and appreciating this food sometimes they like go into themselves like this reminds me of my childhood and having specific visions involving food that comes up a lot in, in well and course. people have like literal orgasms in their clothes yes their clothes tear off. They're, there's like uh it, they're not something that's li- their clothes don't literally tear off their bodies. It's an image. Yes. Like you cut back to them and they're clothed and again. They're, but... they're like chewing on the food with their eyes closed, just thinking about. Yeah, something. but that's something that when the judge tastes his food and got a cookery, mm-hmm. she just goes through this whole dance and thing, and she's literally rolling on a. Uh, she's like a tiny person rolling on short ribs. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I still remember the first time I saw it with a, my uh, roommate at the time. And, like, basically the last 20 minutes of the movie, or 15 minutes of the movie, he couldn't stop laughing. He was just, <laughs> he was out of breath crying. Yeah, it's pretty zany. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, the fact that it doesn't have a good home video release mm-hmm. uh, means that the food doesn't look as mouth-watering as, it, it, yeah. as you would hope it would. Yeah, that's <laughs> Um, and it doesn't really teach you to make things. No, it, it pulls from Hong Kong food, Chinese food, a little bit of French food. Mm-hmm. It does. It, it's sort of, it's a cartoon version of how to mm-hmm. make this food. Um, yeah. And I, I kept on noticing that they use just a little bit of, of ingredients to make like a whole dish. Like mm-hmm. I used a little bit of this and, and, and added it to, to flavor the, even the slightest like garnish of this bigger dish. There's a lot of excess like that. It is kind of like watching an episode of Iron Chef where you're just, okay, I guess yeah, they just are doing things so fast and the camera's yeah. whipping around and they're trying to, the the just the hosts are trying to explain or the mm-hmm. commentators are trying to explain, but it's not very, if you don't know about cooking, you right. you can't really follow it. It's the sources of, of all their, their food that they use and... The, the secret ingredient, mm-hmm. how important or how rare it is. And yeah, it's it's it's, it's different when you're in the no, quote unquote. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if it makes me as hungry as some of these other movies do, but uh, <laughs> it made me hungry enough. Yeah. Uh, nice noodle bowl stuff. I always like a good noodle bowl. Yeah, we got noodles yesterday. And oh, that God, did, it was awful. That didn't work out so good. Yeah, apparently... Uh, Chinese buffets are not ready for us. No, we, were, we, <laughs> we got our shots, so we thought we were ready for a Chinese buffet, and the Chinese buffets are not ready for us. It's a letdown. A lot of, a lot of the good stuff. But so. we got fortune cookies. Yeah. So God of Cookery is specifically Hong Kong food. Well, of sorts. And uh, because it's a Hong Kong movie, and it was made the year before Hong Kong was reabsorbed by um, mm, China. Mm-hmm. So it really, and it still has its own culture. It's not the same as Chinese food. Yeah. Then again, Chinese food, what we think of as Chinese food in America mm-hmm. is uh, really American Chinese food. Americanized, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's, speaking of the documentaries that we're not covering, there's uh, Finding General So, is that what it was called? Oh, something like that. That was fantastic, though. Which is really about how how... Uh, American Chinese cuisine is its own thing. 
Correct. It is an authentic type of food, but it's stuff that was made up. Yes, it was a Chinese chef that came to the United States and fed some people in a hotel, and he made up this dish um, invoking someone named General So, and it's really, you know, up for debate who that person really is. And it's, it's kind of uh, tempered to be not so hot for American tongues and just sweet enough to, and having MSG to have people coming back and getting more of it. Yeah. Uh, it's called The Search for General So. Ah, I see. So it, that, that's when I would definitely recommend it if we're talking about documentaries, which we're not. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about documentaries. No. Nope. But anyway, uh, so yeah, I don't know exactly what makes Hong Kong food Hong Kong food. I but you help. do. Yes. Okay. Um, it's wok frying. They did a lot oh, of wok frying Yes, there. there's a lot of wok frying. Uh, hot peppers, ginger, garlic, rice or noodles with meat, uh, seafood and rice. Uh, they did a lot of rice bowls there, along with the pissing fish balls. There was a lot of rice being made. Mm-hmm. Uh, soy sauce, steaming, use of vegetables, water chestnuts, mushrooms, and bamboo shoots. So not entirely different from what we think of as Chinese food well, either. Yeah, I mean... There's like, Sichuan is an, an area of, of China that's mostly known for their spicy food. Hong Kong has their own levels of spice that they work with. And oh. there's obviously street food being made. Yeah, yeah, which is like Japan, the street food is, mm-hmm. is a sort of culture that we don't have so much here. We had, it's it's like there's street food now, like We food have trucks. like hot dog stands and carts and stuff. Yeah, but hot dogs really is what it was and that's. That's not which even... Which is German. Yeah, which is German in any way. <laughs> it probably came out of German immigrants, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. So, and then, okay... Oh, your, 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 your grandpa comes out of, of New York cooking or baking. Well, sort of, yeah. My, my grandfather, my mom's father, his family were uh, the immigrants. The one who saw... Um, uh, oh, the one who saw and loved uh, Cook, Cook the Thief his Wife. No. Lover. He was, uh, he was uh, his family was immigrants uh, from Russia... And they opened a uh, delicatessen. It was mostly um, a bakery, though. Mm-hmm. And the so, ideal. Yeah, and so he learned uh, the, the modern bakery, uh, uh, modern delicatessen. Mm-hmm. Uh, he learned baking tricks from his dad. But he mostly, he was interested in, uh, uh, he was an English professor, so he was yeah. interested in... And you said that he liked the the book, or it was like about literature. Yeah, yeah, you he would like that? a movie oh. if it was like technically. Uh, uh, Cook the thief, his wife, and his lover, and her lover is not based on a book, mm-hmm. but it is of literature. So yeah, Correct. anything he would like would be of literature. Mm-hmm. But that's actually a good segue because uh, the last movie is the only American movie we're covering mm-hmm. is 1996's The Big Night. Just it's Big dr- Night. Or sorry, just Big Night. Yep. It's directed by Campbell Scott and Stamp. Maybe the sequel will be called The Big Night. The like Big the Night. The Batman. The Bigger Night. Bigger Night. <laughs> uh, it's directed by Campbell Scott and Stanley Tucci, who are art, art artists. Okay. They are artists. Artists. They're Let's actors. About my craft. This is like halfway between those Chinese big feast movies. Yes. And modern food documentaries about restaurant culture. Mm-hmm. And with um, a big feast movies, similar truths come out in this movie too. Yeah, and so this is a this is a very, like almost made in a lab allegory. No, I'm no? going somewhere else. I'm going somewhere less positive <laughs> at the beginning here. This to me is like, um, if you want to talk about mid '90s indie cinema, oh, quote right. unquote indie yes. cinema. You even got Mini Driver in. There. Yeah, it's got. It's directed by actors. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not produced by the Weinsteins, mm-hmm. but um, it feels like it was. I remember the very first scene where they say the, what the production company is. I was like, "This is Mir- This is not Miramax." Yeah, it wasn't Miramax. I was so surprised. Um, directed by it, it has a sort of nostalgic look at the immigrant experience specifically, which mm-hmm. is something that a lot of those movies mm-hmm. like. Um, it seemed on the outset relatively timeless, but it is the fifties. Yeah, it specifically takes place in the fifties, um, and. Uh, it's very loose formally. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a strictly. Uh, it's sort of as a movie that's just the story happens as it happens from scene to scene. Correct. It's definitely a, a movie made by actors. Mm-hmm. It, not to say that it's visually unappealing. It's actually pretty well done visually. Yes. It's just that it is designed around scenes mm-hmm. rather than set pieces. Mm-hmm. Um. It, yeah, that could have been a stage play. 
pretty easily. Very easily. There's basically would be four sets. There was a point where they went to um, to the seashore for some sort of ingredient. That's the only t in like a car. That's the only time where they were off like this, like one block. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like a very specific '90s thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. No. I think that cliches aren't inherently bad, mm -mm. and that the good movies of their eras and types rise to the top, and we ignore all the other ones. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those movies that people still remember and enjoy and like. Yes. And so it might be like a lot of other movies, but it did it better. Mm -hmm. And it was and so it's a very mid nineties flavor. Mm -hmm. Um there yeah, there are just certain things about it about it that uh bother me as someone who doesn't like that era of movies very much. Right. But they're almost all vibe, which is not a really fair way to judge anything. I think a lot of that was at play too between the two brothers and what they represent because Primo, the oldest, was all about classic Italian mm -hmm. food keeping up uh, appearances within your restaurant, sticking with it even though you're not doing so. But Secundo, the younger brother, he like wanted to get bigger and, and be like the restaurant across the street and really embrace like American values and succeed. Right. And, and have so, enough money to show for it. And so, yeah, that's basically the plot is that there's this failing restaurant from mm -hmm. these two brothers who we don't know exactly how long they've been living in America. I don't think they ever specified. They do on the beach. I think they're like 15. Yeah, it's 15 been, years? it's been a while and they've been trying to get this restaurant started. Yes. And they know that they have special food, especially Segundo's food. And Segundo is played by uh, Tony Shalhoub. Um, no, Pr Primo is Tony Shalhoub. Primo is Tony Shalhoub. <laughs> Sorry. Primo's food is especially good. Yes. And tu Tucci plays um, Segundo. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they basically are going to be, sh they're not going to be able to keep, they, uh, they're mm -hmm. having bank problems. They're, um, they're selling their food for credit in the form of paintings. Right. Because Primo views this whole experience as an art. Mm -hmm. And he's refusing to let, like their first scene in the movie is, uh, is sort of, idiot american she she wanted um pasta on the side of her right and well so so the basic idea yeah it's it's that that they don't uh he's he, not willing he doesn't to think like... that there should be compromise oh no no, no, no for no. the sake of uh of popularity mm -hmm. meanwhile they have a friend quote a frenemy mm -hmm. who is uh played by uh Ian Holm. Ian Holm, who apparently worked with Tucci on multiple movies that told Tucci directed. I didn't realize that they were that close. Mm -hmm. Uh and he has a much more successful restaurant, but mm -hmm. it's super garish. It's hell. Yeah, it's literally <laughs> called the the restaurants are literally called Heaven and Hell. Pretty much. Pretty much. Clouds? I can't remember what the paradise. name of it. The Paradise. Yes. Paradise and uh, Inferno. You sure? I, I think it's something like after somebody's name. Okay. Anyway, there's there's this pretty clear uh, religious metaphor. Absolutely. Um, and Ian Holmes' character wants their place to close because he wants to poach them as chefs. Yes. Uh, but he, and this is like, one of the things that bothered me about the movie is that there's no surprises in it, really. Yeah. I wasn't. Swords. Um, but he, uh, in, Implies that he is friends with uh, Louis Tito Prima. Puente. No? Louis Prima. Louis Prima. What is wrong with <laughs> you? Sorry. <laughs> Louis Prima. <laughs> uh, Tito Puente. That would have been later. Yeah, um, Louis Prima. And that he can get Prima to come to the restaurant. Yes. And so a bunch of people come to the restaurant. On the premise of On the premise there. of meeting Louis Prima. They have and that's a... the quote, big night. Yes. So majority of the movie takes place over a single night. Yes. There's a little bit of stuff from the day before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, Louis Prima is not going to come. Mm -hmm. And the movie ends on an ambiguous note. I think it's implied that they, they had a, uh, uh, a critic there. Right. Who, who I think is going to go tell his paper that's, how. You were like, that's how it's going to end. It's I knew it, but, but it kind of cuts, it cuts away at the end of the, at the, as morning comes around. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think that that's where I assume it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's the plot, and then and then meanwhile Stanley Tucci has a girlfriend in Minnie Driver, who's a mm -hmm. young kind of idealistic American girl, yes. and he's having an affair with Isabella Mussolini, who is Ian Holmes' wife, Correct. who's more like the old country, mm -hmm. femme fatale type. Yes. Um, very Sophia Loren. Yeah, very Sophia Loren. Mm -hmm. 
only actual Italian in the whole movie. <laughs> uh, well, maybe the the barber next door. Is yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am sure Tucci is. I mean, Tucci sounds Italian to me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's in the name. Yeah. So, uh, but a lot of the movie does like break down into uh, the uh, uh, commerce versus art, mm-hmm. and so I think the mm-hmm. great. So the metaphor. We're clear on the religious metaphor. You say metaphor, but yes. Well, you, it can't be literal because they're not literal. It's never uh, made literal. Okay. The, the religious metaphor is the first layer metaphor. I think, from the way I read it, is that it is a movie about filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And filmmaking from the perspective of, of actors who want to be artists. Mm-hmm. And having to balance commerce and art. Mm-hmm. And having uh, this sort of... Big studios. Studio entity sabotaging what you're doing promising something and promising something mm-hmm. and then saying oh too bad but you can do this thing for me instead mm-hmm. really seems like something a studio would do is promise an actor they could do their their dream project Prestige, and then yeah. and then ah oh, we just didn't have the money for it anyway come to do our big studio movie anyway yeah. um and the way that the brothers seem to rec- to represent literally like just one person and it's just one person's argument with himself. They're brothers too. There's a Cain and Abel thing going on, mm-hmm. but um, but I think that in a, in a lot of ways they're supposed to be the same person dealing with how do I get through this? Correct, and it it could be too like maybe a script writer uh-huh. and uh, yeah, you could apply it to almost any job in a in the film industry, right? Um, and then uh, uh, the idea that. Uh, the immigrant idea is something that this sort of is the literal theme of the movie is that the mm-hmm. idea of immigrants uh, being, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, Making it? No, no. Assimilated? No. Assimilated, thank okay. you. Okay, sure. And I think, I think it has, a, uh, the fact that it ends on uh, an ambiguous note makes me a little happy because it feels up until that point that it's going to end up being one of those... Uh, yeah, it's hard to be an immigrant, but if you just pull yourself up and try hard enough, you'll get through it. Mm-hmm. So the fact that we don't know if they actually got through it made me a little happy that they weren't being so black and It was nice so that they ended on, on, on breakfast. I was, like, amazed that he was able to flip those eggs in one try. That's true. They end on that breakfast. Their uh, uh, one waiter is... Uh, Mark Anthony. And Mark Anthony, uh, who hadn't done a lot of acting. He was still right. mostly a singer then. Mm-hmm. He's acted more since then. Um, that the food prep is all fucking awesome. Yes, I love. And I do, and I mean, I just like Italian. I think everyone, most of us like Italian food. Correct. And it's sort of a mix of really proper Italian food and then what, you know, again, like the Chinese food has Americanized Chinese food. This is kind of an Americanized version. And of they Ch- make that huge pasta pie. Yeah. Epic. Which, yeah, that's like something you would see on your Food Wars show. Mm-hmm. Where there'll be some sort of really special specifically themed thing that no one's ever thought to make mm-hmm. before this feels like it's on the verge of that like it's yeah, his special it's like so classic. nobody's ever made this specific right. thing this is his recipe who would he think made to make up. that right um but so this is the case where we're arguing differently that i don't mm-hmm. think there's a lot of magical realism in this one um i think that the the supernatural implications are th- their their subtext i but you think that we should be reading it more literally as as being religious yes they're a parable sort of sort of um it's definitely biblical that they need to they're they're being tempted by the devil in Mm -hmm. hell Mm -hmm. it's all red he has certain influences a whole lot of friends that have probably also bowed to his Mm -hmm. his temptations um and then i i have a specific note about how um uh, when Isabella Rossellini says, you know, you know, he didn't tell you. It's it's a shame that he didn't tell you. And maybe you you guys will get through this. I know you will. I, and I put the specific note. Maybe the devil is a woman. Maybe she was the devil all along. That she was like wanting them through temptation, making it seem like it was so easy. But then these these two men, they like bear their souls on this beach, saying, you know, why do we have to stay here? Why is it so hard? And that just really spoke to me about their angels on earth and like, why is living and being mortal so hard? We were not promised this. When we were in Italy, 
we were, we were told that this is where we would make our money and we would find fame and fortune, but now we just have to go back on this premise that our uncle will take us back and, and be chef at his restaurant. So that's ultimately where it could lead next. Like it, they could find fame from this critic talking about their restaurant or after this breakfast is done, they're going to pack up and go back to Italy to their uncle. Right. And yeah, so for me, that is, that is just a, a distillation of th- the sort of myth of the American uh, uh, immigrant mm-hmm. experience. And fifties is a good time for it. That was a time it was a little better to be an immigrant. I oh, think. for sure. Um, Post war. And definitely have a business. And have a business and be welcome, and people are a little more interested in your food mm-hmm. now. There's um, like actual nightlife now. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, I didn't see it as quite so, I, I think that they were using the biblical stuff as, as for flavor to, to heighten all You had read something about how their, um, their set decoration was, like, meant to be symbolic and biblical. Yeah, that was, like, one of the only... I, I I looked into finding free like online essays about any of this stuff, mm-hmm. and like one of the only essays I could find was an old review that was only focused on the uh, set designs mm-hmm. and names of the two restaurants as being heaven and hell. Yes. That was it. That was all I could. I was like, oh shit. I was hoping to find something <laughs> a little little more. But but well, and the thing that might mean I'm wrong about the the uh, filmmaking uh, metaphor mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that that is literally. That not, I keep saying literally. That's not what I mean. Okay. That is the uh, metaphor for the movie Chef. Yes. And we had also actually just watched something about that. Yeah, like a YouTube clip. Or and something. so that might have just been in my brain, but mm-hmm. I still, I still really think the. I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be about filmmaking. It sort of be about any kind of art, mm-hmm. where you're, you're not satisfied with making somebody else's art. Yeah. So like, you either want to be rich or famous or do the right. Thing and, and you think you yourself can, and, and you think the two can meet but they really can't there has to be a compromise one mm-hmm. way or the other um so uh yeah so what's italian food what do you <laughs> uh, italian food has ingredients like garlic oregano basil you had a, a recent um pulling of of your heart between different uh pizzas you're like which one was the one i liked basil at? or oregano I yeah remember. oh at punch pizza you're like the basis of it i i pretty sure you're an oregano guy anyway there's also fennel red and white meats egg noodles uh simile of flour tomatoes spinach lemon is particularly uh, northern italy red wine olives softer cheeses and soft breads and dried preserved sausages and of course pizza pizza pizza, pizza and spaghetti pizza pizza um is that all we got yeah, I mean, that was it. That's what we watched. Uh, I know, again, keep going back to Ratatouille. Mm-hmm. Probably the movie that made me the hungriest in my lifetime is watching Ratatouille. I always like to do Dreams of Sushi. That's like yeah. my, my happy place movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's 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 the idea of, of food-themed movies that aren't documentaries, that have either a vague or not-so-vague uh, uh, my- mystic realism vibe. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, we do have our, our fortune cookies, fortune so cookies from the our, restaurant. So from gonna... our shitty uh, Chinese buffet. This is supposed to be how um, our entire podcast was supposed to go. Yeah. This is kind of like our Karnak note instead of an envelope that we were supposed to supposed to relate to it. Um, oh, your Chinese my word? lucky numbers are 17, 19, 4, 1, 47, and 46. I also have 17 as my lucky number. Oh. There you go. So my fortune is, you will reach the highest possible point in your business or profession. Shit, this is going viral. You know what else? What? Minus, a man cannot be comfortable without his own approval. <laughs> do, you, do you did you enjoy this podcast? Yeah. No. So um. Do you have anything you need to promote? <laughs> well, you can reach me as usual. On the uh, Giner Grinder uh, website, uh, where I should have some uh, more reviews coming up soon. Uh, on the uh, Giner Grinder Twitter, on my personal Twitter, which is Gabe M, as in Matthew Powers. 
uh, John Grinder Facebook. Uh, eh, that's about it. I don't know exactly what the next episode is going to be, so I'm not going to advertise it yet. You'll probably see me indirectly through uh, Gabe's reviews, being as I do the editing for them. I make sure they spells and um, hyphenates correctly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, until next time. Tip your waiters. Tip your waiters. At least 20%. Uh, don't keep your leftovers longer than a day. Yeah. Our cat just jumped up here. <laughs> Speaking of feeding, oh, someone needs to be fed. All right, I'll let you guys go. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed yourself. And uh, Black Lives Matter. Bye-bye.